Um, uh, so where to begin? Um, it is, uh, Charles is absolutely right. If, I, if my vote came down to me, in, if the vote came down to me in 2016, if I lived in some swing county in Ohio, I probably would have voted for Donald Trump. And depending on what 2020 looks like, I would probably make that same argument. Fortunately, I have never lived anywhere where my vote wasn't canceled out at least nine to one. <laughs> so I've never much cared about the, my vote and I feel for, perfectly liberated to vote symbolically on my preferences. And uh, so I did not vote for Donald Trump uh, last time and I probably will not vote for him again because I don't really care much about my vote. Um, what I do care about is telling the truth as I see it. And so what I believed at the time, I was a never Trumper. I called myself a never Trumper. Shortly after the election, I said never, I was a, no longer a never Trumper because for me, what never Trump meant was I wasn't gonna vote for the guy and I wasn't gonna lie about the guy. And so you only have one president at the time and my obligation as a journalist, as an intellectual for want of a less haughty, pretentious word, um, is to tell the truth as I see it. And one of the most dismaying things in the uh, hothouse years of 2015 and 2016 um, that I experienced was to find so many people who had ostensibly the same job description as I did, perfectly willing when push came to shove, to lie when the little red light on the cameras went on and to say something completely different when the little red light on the cameras went off. And I find that profoundly dishonorable and a small sign of the corruption that has overtaken much of the right and the conservative movement. Um, that said, I'm not a member also of the resistance, just to be clear. You know, the resistance argument is constantly, you know, I don't know, Donald Trump put salt on his french fries. Hitler put salt on his french fries, right? I mean, it's a really childish kind of argumentation that I don't cotton to. Um, for the record, Donald Trump is not Hitler. Hitler could have repealed Obamacare. Um, <laughs> Uh, part of my fundamental disagreement with Charles is that Charles takes the position um, that there is a coherent, historically grounded, reasonable, ideological explanation to Trumpism. That Trump is an avatar for a set of coherent ideas that he may not always communicate coherently, but they're there nonetheless. I reject this virtually entirely. Um, I do not think Donald Trump is remotely an intellectual. I have it on fairly good authority. He hasn't read a book in decades. Um, he does not, he is quite explicit that he doesn't consider himself um, beholden to any serious body of ideas or commitments. He says, I have to be flexible. The highest um, metric of wisdom for him is his own instincts, which he has said countless times. Um, and so I see Trumpism fundamentally as a psychological phenomenon, both in terms of understanding Donald Trump himself and vast swaths of his most intense support. It is not because there are millions of people who did not realize that they were uh, loyal to a pre-Cold War ideology of the Republican Party and finally had Donald Trump come along to represent their ideas and articulate them. It's that they liked the guy. And this is one of the reasons why I did it. I mean, I'm not, we're not gonna get into the punditry, but when Charles says, Donald Trump so easily beat 16 more qualified people for the presidency. I don't see that as a sign of his superior arguments, in part because he made so few, but I see it as a sign of the fact that we had a collective action problem in the primaries, and that when you have a 16-person race, uh, all you need to hold on to is a very significantly small plurality of voters, and you can ride all the way to the end until it's just you versus one or two other people, and that's what happened. If it had been a one or two or three if you had one or two or three competitors in the primaries, I very much doubt we would be talking about President Trump right now. So it was not because of the, his ideas had finally arrived, it was that things are going on in the culture that made Donald Trump much more compelling. And I think these are problems, this is where I'm very much on Patrick Deneen's side of the problems with our society. We are viewing politics more and more as a form of entertainment. And I will grant you this, Donald Trump is entertaining. He has turned our politics itself into a kind of reality show logic. I keep waiting for Omarosa to throw red wine in someone's face on the White House lawn. Um, I also disagree with Charles, and I'll get to my prepared remarks in a second. I, I also disagree with Charles 
um, almost entirely on his, this idea that Donald Trump stands for identitarianism. I think Donald Trump stands for a kind of identitarianism. Populism is fundamentally, historically, a form of identity politics. It uh, it's uses the language of all of the people, but in reality it only refers to a subset of the people and says those people are the legitimate people, those are the good people. Donald Trump is the first president in the American history, or at least in the modern era that I'm aware of, that talks as if his biggest fans are the only voters who really count, the only voters who are imbued with any kind of real virtue. My people are the best people, he loves to say. And anybody who opposes his people, he attacks, because they also oppose him. And so it is not that he is standing for political correctness, he's doing a kind of fan service. Because when you, have, when you have this sort of tribal understanding of politics as us versus them, as a form of gladiatorial entertainment, you start justifying what he does on the grounds that it's, he's owning the libs, or their tears are delicious, right? It is, not, um, it is not a serious ideological program. And I have some personal experience with this. Donald Trump tried to get me fired from Fox News and from National Review. Um, and one of his favorite arguments was that we got into a Twitter fight where I accused him in 2015 of tweeting like a 14-year-old girl laid up, 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 up too late at night. And for days, he would go after me saying, how dare you be so disrespectful to women? This is outrageous. You have to, re you have to, re you have to resign or be fired. That is, so in that is so disrespectful of women. He was playing a politically correct card against me because it was the nearest weapon to hand. The idea that charging me of being politically incorrect will get me fired from Fox News and from National Review lacked a certain situational awareness, but that's a different issue. Also, during the primaries, when Jeb Bush had some gaffe where he said something about women's health, Donald Trump for days attacked Jeb Bush as being anti-woman. So in other words, it's not, it's a, if you understand it as a psychological phenomenon, he grabs the nearest weapon to hand. And if political correctness will work for him, he will use it, because he doesn't care, because he is not bound by a coherent ideological or philosophical point of view. So one of the reasons why I think we're in this moment, other than the fact that we're watching politics as an entertainment, or rather, I'd say that's a symptom of the moment that we're in, is that it's an ironic moment. We, we live in one of the most partisan, arguably the most partisan time in living memory. But at the same time, our parties are weaker than they have ever been. And that creates, that is a function of lots of things that have been going on, a sort of anti-institutionalism that has been going on, a breakdown of civil society. I think right now there are only two institutions in America that a majority of Americans have faith and confidence in. Uh, it's the military and small business, and police are sort of on a bubble. Everything else is below water. Churches, schools, um, higher education, lower, uh, you know, K through 12, lawyers, doctors, clergy. Everybody has lost faith and confidence. And so in that world, what happens is, as you no longer have institutions that can form character, that can, that can filter out bad actors, we start looking to brands, including personal brands, celebrities, whether it's Taylor Swift or Kanye West or, or Kim Kardashian or Donald Trump. Donald Trump comes from that world of brands. And people allotted, uh, aligned with him on those terms, not on philosophical terms. And I'll, I'll give you some evidence to that in a little bit. So one of the results of the breakdown of the, the breakdown of the power of the parties is that other institutions have served as the, the political scientist Stephen Tellis talks about this. Other institutions have taken up the slack and serve as de facto organs of the, of the parties. Conservative magazines, uh, think tanks, uh, various grassroots organizations, Fox News, talk radio, MSNBC, all of these things. They're doing jobs that were once relegated to the political parties to do, of communicating a message, of getting out the vote, of providing arguments for public debate. And that's all fine. That's what I've done for my entire adult life, be, is be part of that system. And I'm not, I think there's a lot of good things that go with that system. But the 2016 election changed the equation. Because for the first time, you had this disruptor, this outsider who came in, and a lot of people who fancied themselves as journalists or intellectuals or, or, or objective analysts were forced to choose whether or not they were gonna play the role of cheerleader for a team in terms of the Republican Party, or whether they were gonna still say th call it as they saw it. And that dynamic is what caused those people 
and I referenced earlier, to lie on television in defense of Donald Trump and then say something completely different when the cameras went off. Because when push came to shove, they saw themselves more as tribal members of a political party or a team than they saw themselves as objective observers, no matter how conservative they were. And so I can tell you stories about people who would go on camera and say, you know, Donald Trump is a passionate constitutionalist who believes in limited government and all this kind of stuff. And then the camera will go off and they would turn to me and they would say, I can't believe I have to defend this guy. <laughs> you don't. I think most journalistic ethics are kind of BS, but one of the things I believe in passionately is you're not supposed to say or write things you don't believe to be true. But this is part of the corruption that Donald Trump has had on the Republican Party on the conservative movement, is that lots of people feel the need to say things that aren't true. And over time, they come to believe the things they say are actually true, which is an even deeper form of corruption. We all know the phrase, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton, the guy who coined that, he believed that. He was a good liberal and he believed in curtailing power. But that's not the context of where the quote comes from. The quote comes from a letter that he wrote to a guy named, I think his name was Crichton, um, who was writing a history of the Reformation era popes, also known to some as the, the bad popes. And, um, and he asked, basically, Crichton was saying, shouldn't I cut them some slack given the job they have to do? Shouldn't they, you know, shouldn't we make allowances for them and all the rest? And Acton writes back, I cannot accept your canon that we are to ju judge Pope and King unlike other men with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, if there's any presumption, it is the other way against the holders of power, increasing as the power increases. Historic responsibility has to make up for the want of legal responsibility. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and authority, still more when they super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. There is no worse heresy than, the, than that the office sanctifies the holder. In other words, Donald Trump does things today that if he were your neighbor or your coworker or your boss, most of you would condemn. But because he's the leader of the free world, we are supposed to judge him by a different standard. I don't agree with that either. In, in Charles's essay, Thinking About Trump, which is a great essay, he makes the perfectly valid point that America has seen immoral leaders before, and certainly that we've had leaders who've done immoral things. Can't argue with any of that. Two things need to be said about this, though. First, the form of this argumentation is a little familiar. It's the sort of approach the left often takes to defending some present-day icon or figure by pointing out how terrible America's past heroes were. Charles is nowhere near as crass or as hostile to America's historic heroes. He just seeks to defend Donald Trump by pulling some of the founding fathers and Martin Luther King down to Donald Trump's level. Second, Charles has written more on the subject of statesmanship than I have. Charles has written more on the subject of statesmanship than I have read. But it seems to me that this is a good place to point out that hypocrisy is the vice, that the hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. Governor Morris may have been a cad. Martin Luther King may have had affairs. None of them went around bragging about it. There's a certain responsibility that comes for men in power to at least rhetorically uphold certain notions of virtue. Donald Trump does not agree with this because it is a psychological phenomenon, not a political phenomenon. Donald Trump in his books brags about betting married women. He brags about betraying business partners. He described, we talk about how he didn't serve in the military, that's true, but he did say avoiding venereal disease in the 1970s was his personal Vietnam. He brags about his wealth as if it's the greatest single measure of a man. In his essay, Charles ignores these and countless other aspects of Trump's character, and wisely so, to instead defend Trump, defend Trump as a maker and a builder of things and to celebrate his courage. I agree there is a kind of courage to Donald Trump because in a way, shamelessness is a superpower. If you truly have no sense of personal shame and you think negative attention is more, it, Donald Trump prefers positive attention. He clearly likes praise, but he'll take negative attention over no attention at all any day of the week. He has to be the center of the limelight, which is one of the reasons why he is constantly tweeting like an escaped monkey from a cocaine study. I 
I agree that there's a great tradition in American history of builders and makers, um, but I don't think the tide of that history can lift Donald Trump's boat nearly as high as, as Charles would have it. In many ways, Donald Trump is an exception to the rule in the business world. It was Max Weber who pointed out in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism that certain behaviors tend to lead towards prosperity. Thrift, honest dealings, hard work. Donald Trump definitely works hard. He's not good with thrift. Um, uh, and he's not good with honest dealings. He comes instead, he's in many ways, there's a great cartoon explaining what winner's bias is in economics. In economics, winner's bias, it shows, it shows um, a guy saying, they told me to give up, they told me it was, a pointless, it was pointless to keep going, but I listened to my gut. I stuck with it. I said no to the naysayers, and I kept buying those lottery tickets. <laughs> and now look at me, right, because he wins. Um, Donald Trump violated almost all the rules of good business practices, which is one of the reasons why he couldn't borrow money on normal capital markets in America. Um, it's why he used bankruptcy laws and eminent domain in countless ways to better himself. He is, I know a few billionaires. I would, he's the only, Donald Trump is the only billionaire I know who thought it was worth his time to hawk vitamin supplements and, uh, and, uh, and steaks on YouTube to run a Ponzi scheme for an educational foundation. Every other major rich person in the world, when, when Forbes comes out with its list of the top richest people, they say, oh no, you've got my number too high. That's crazy, I don't belong on the list. Donald Trump threatens to sue because the number is too low. Um, Patrick Deneen in his book uh, references Alexander Solzhenitsyn's famous 1978 commencement address to Harvard, and he, and in which Solzhenitsyn says, if one is right from a legal point of view, nothing more is required. This is the problem with modernity, is that we reduce everything to whether or not, if it's, if it's not against the law, it's okay, right? It says, if one is right from a legal point of view, nothing more is required. Nobody may mention that one could still be entirely right and urge self-restraint or a renunciation of these rights, call for sacrifice and selfless risk. This would simply sound absurd. Voluntary self-restraint is almost unheard of. Everyone strives towards further expansion to the extreme, the extreme limits of legal frames. Take a look at Donald Trump's 1,500 page tax return and you get the point. Donald Trump defends all of his practices by saying he didn't violate the law. And in his books, he talks about people who bring too much moralism to business as being stuffed shirts. He, is, he brags about how he did everything he could to get as rich as possible. He said he, was, he, 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 he makes greed into a vice unto itself. The irony is, Charles wrote a wonderful piece, because he was in the audience that day at Harvard at graduation. Um, and he wrote about Solzhenitsyn's address where he said, Solzhenitsyn was arresting because, because he spoke of the truth as if it were true. Now, I have no problem, no problem whatsoever, with people, in a, in a principled fashion, with people who want to make the transactional case for Trump. The 2016 election was not a referendum on Donald Trump's philosophy. Donald Trump did not win because of his American first agenda. He won because he had, because in his infinite wisdom, he chose not to be Hillary Clinton. And an enormous number of people did not want Hillary Clinton to be president. His only two real mandates that unified the conservative movement and the Republican Party was not being Hillary Clinton, which he achieved on day one of his presidency, um, and two, promising to appoint conservative ju judges and justices. I'm all in favor of both of these things. People keep accusing me of being pro-Hillary. I challenge them, you have $1,000 if you can find a sentence I've written in 20 years in favor of Hillary Clinton. So I have no problem with that. Donald Trump, has, lots of good things have happened on his watch. There's a really interesting debate about how much of what's happened on Donald Trump's watch is because of him or in spite of him, and maybe we can get to that during the Q&A. But the problem is, is that because of the nature of our politics today, you can't just simply make the transactional argument, right? The, the nature of our political marketplace is such that you have to celebrate the man. You have to declare the man himself is the world's greatest negotiator and playing 4D chess and create a boulder so heavy even he can't lift it. We have to treat him as if he is the, this heroic figure. 
In other words, people have to lie. And that is a profound moral compromise. And you listen to a lot of my colleagues on Fox News, if you say, yeah, I really like the judges, but I think the guy has bad character, they, they'll set their heads on fire. Because you have to be all in for the team, and part of that is human nature. Donald Trump acts in a lot of ways like the head man of a tribe. People by nature do not want to believe they are following a bad person. And so what happens is the definition of good gets bent to the man rather than the man being bent to the definition. He's not striving towards an ideal of good. We are rewriting the ideal of good to fit Donald Trump. And so when he goes around disrupting democratic norms, when he goes around being crass and crude, people say, well, that's what he was elected to do, or he was elected to be a disruptor. And the very same people then will excoriate Democrats or others who violate norms in response to Donald Trump, saying how dare they do that, as if Donald Trump has a specific license to violate norms that no one else does. That's not how politics works. And so I want to be clear, this form of corruption, which is very much of what Acton talked about, is not just at the top. It's from below as well. Um, I'll give you one very good example of this. In 2011, there was a poll asking whether an elected official who commits immoral acts in their personal life can still be a good public servant. The context was basically adultery and that kind of thing. And I'm sorry, I'm, smoke, I'm drinking so much water, I smoked an enormous amount of pot before I got here and I get dry mouth. <laughs> so they asked people whether or not you can be immoral in your private life and still be a good public servant, right? Uh, and fitting the stereotype only 30% of white evangelical Christians, self-identified evangelical Christians, said that this was true, right? They were the most judgmental demographic on the list. Fast forward to 2016, they asked the same question. And the number of white evangelical Christians who said you can be immoral in your private life and still be a good public servant more than doubled, doubled to 72%. Now, this means that these trends hold true today, and I have to assume that they do. I don't think they've updated the poll since then. That means that white evangelical Christians are today the single most tolerant demographic in America of sexual impropriety and infidelity in public servants. That's corruption. And so my view of all of this is by all means, we can have an argument about the public policy. We can have an argument about the appointments. But for me, public conservatism, when you strip it of prudential questions and metaphysical allegiances and all the rest boils down to just two things. The importance of ideas and the importance of character. The importance of ideas means this idea rooted in the, in the American founding, in the, in the English Enlightenment, that through logic and reason and appeals to conscience with facts and evidence employed by logic and reason, one can persuade people that certain things are better than other things, that certain approaches are preferable to others. And the other is this idea of character, which just simply says that your internal character matters. How you live in the world matters in, as, a term, as a kind of virtue. There is no definition of good character, I would argue, that Donald Trump can clear. Even if I'm willing to stipulate that, that Donald Trump has more courage than I believe and as much courage as Charles believes. There is simply no definition of good character. Forget the fact that he has more ex-wives than the previous 44 presidents combined. That doesn't matter, right? In business, in personal life, in the way he conducts himself in public, you cannot say the man is of good character, and I won't. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Charles is corrupt and I'm not saying he's lying, but my problem with his arguments is that he is, he is giving breathing room and space to people who are dumber and more corrupt <laughs> than Charles is to make precisely those kinds of arguments. And I see it every day in the trenches in Washington where I see young pundits, people like, I don't know, Charlie Kirk and these people, who simply think that the definition of conservatism is a personality cult of Donald Trump. That's not what conservatism is supposed to be. We are not, Bill Rusher at National Review used to say, Politicians will always disappoint you. Put not your faith in princes. And that spirit has overtaken so much of the right, and it breaks my heart. And so as Alexandra Solzhenitsyn said, you can resolve to live your life with integrity, but let your credo be this. 
Let the lie come into the world, let it even triumph, but not through me. And that is my approach to all this. It's cost me friends, it's cost me money, it's cost me not a good night's sleep. But for me, I'm perfectly happy to celebrate the good things that come as a result of Donald Trump being president or Hillary Clinton not being president, but I'm not gonna say the guy is something that he is not. And what he is not is a good man. Thank you very much. Maybe I can uh, ask a few questions of each of our speakers. And Charles, maybe just to have you respond to uh, what what Donald Trump, according to Jonah, is really attacking uh, the moral foundations of conservatism and corrupting conservatives' judgments. Uh, How how do you respond? What do you think? Well, I think if, uh, if...